Good morning or good afternoon, whatever it may be. Uh, just one quick announcement. Dr. Seeley's not here today. He's off uh, in Canada on university business. Uh, but he did want me to announce that apparently there's been some kind of an issue with discussion one. If you've had some problems with it online, uh, he'll be addressing that next week when he's back. So sit tight on that if you've had some grief there. Well, once again, we'd like to welcome you to the Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. Uh, today we have with us Lane Beatty, who is the President and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber, a position he has held since 2003. He can rightly be called Utah's business leader. Under his direction, the Chamber has embraced a new era of business leadership that blends the best of a traditional Chamber with top-notch and powerful business advocacy. During his tenure at the helm of Utah's largest and longest-standing statewide business association, the Chamber has strengthened Utah's economy by investing in transportation, reforming our health system, improving education, and expanding international business. The Chamber was also the driving force behind Salt Lake City's Downtown Rising, a movement to enhance Utah's capital city that supported unprecedented investment in Salt Lake City's Central Business District. Today, under Lane's leadership, the Chamber continues to support pro-business policies that will provide enduring benefit for the state economy. A real estate professional for over 25 years, Lane was elected to the Utah State Senate in 1988. He became Majority Whip in 91, Majority Leader in 92, and in 1994 was elected as State Senate President, a position he held until he left the legislature in 2000. Lane played a crucial role in the success of the 2002 Winter Olympic Games, and you all thought it was Mitt Romney. Uh, which was the largest and has been the largest international event in Utah's history. In June 2000, he was named Chief State Olympic Officer by Governor Mike Levitt, Levitt and played a prominent role in what was called by NBC's President Dick Ebersol, far and away the most successful Olympics summer or winter in history. My assistant dean, who's uh, with us today, Randy Beckham, has always maintained that Lane Beatty is the second most powerful and influential person in the state of Utah. I'll leave it to you to think who might be the most powerful person within our state. Hmm. Any guesses? I'll leave you to think about that. Along with the many honors and accolades he's received over the years, including the honor, uh, uh, Lane was awarded an honorary doctorate from Utah Valley University in 2008. He enjoys golfing and skiing and raises quarter horses. He and his wife, Joy, have three children and nine grandchildren, seven boys and two princesses. So I think in terms of somebody who knows Utah business about as well as anybody in the state, we're fortunate to have with us today Mr. Lane Beatty. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Wright. Right, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, come and talk to students. Uh, it's inspiring to me. Uh, I had the opportunity with uh, with the associate dean to walk around the halls for a little bit and realize that you guys are kind of bursting at the seams here. And uh, I, I get that report on a regular basis and uh, of what's going on here and the growth and the largest institution in the state and all of the great things. But most importantly about that is that is I, I don't get that from uh, the, the greatest accolades don't come from from higher education or the Board of Regents or somebody else telling me how large you've gotten. It comes from business leaders and business leaders who are so thankful to be able to have the quality of education that's being provided by this institution, specifically in the business world and how critical that is. And so thank you all very, very much uh, for your willingness uh, to step forward. Today we're going to talk about uh, uh, several areas uh, dealing with leadership. And uh, I'm going to share some stories with you and point out a, a few things that I think it's very, very critical for you to know and to understand. Thomas Edison once said that uh, restlessness is discontent, and discontent is the first necessity of progress. Show me a thoroughly satisfied man, and I'll show you a failure. How absolutely interesting. So the next time you're frustrated, you're feeling down, you're not satisfied with your life, you're not satisfied with how fast things are moving, with where your standing is, just kneel down and thank God that you have those desires. <laughs> 
because that is what will make a difference in your life. If you become satisfied, you ought to also uh, take into consideration maybe you better uh, gird up a little bit and start doing something a little bit different. Because dissatisfaction is not an, a, 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 a something that is a, a problem. It is a huge asset. David uh, Starr said, There is always room at the top, but the elevator is not always running. You must walk up the stairs oftentimes to meet the success that was intended for you. There are many things that can be said about success or failure and the application that you're here to learn. But I want you to know the older I get and the more experience I have, the more simple it becomes. Because I really do believe that leadership is very simple. Uh, I've had an opportunity to be my life to be touched by great leaders and great men and women who have really affected my life. I have seen great leaders who have been great examples, and I have seen very poor leaders who have been great examples in my life because of things that I've decided early on in my life I never wanted to experience. And because of that, there are certain things that you're going to learn or you're going to have an opportunity to learn from both sides. Utah is a unique place. Utah has, uh, right now, economically, some really uh, phenomenal assets. Uh, most people don't know that. Uh, Utah is right now rated as the number one economy in the United States. Uh, that's a great compliment. Forbes magazine says Utah will lead the nation out of this recession. We right now are adding jobs uh, uh, in substantial numbers. We Every morning, however, if you happen to be one of the 102,000 people who are unemployed in the state, you probably don't uh, agree with those statistics, and life doesn't quite look that rosy to you. But the reality is, is in comparison to anywhere else in the country, we're doing very, very well. And not just because of one industry. One of the great strengths of the state of Utah is diversity of our economy. You've been business students. You understand that when I talk about d diversity of economy, I'm not talking about the color of your skin. I'm talking about that 25 years ago, the state of Utah primarily had two industries. Mining and agriculture. And one of the dilemmas that we had is growing uh, the economy outside of those two entities. Well, today, one of the great strengths, again quoting Forbes magazine, the greatest strength Utah has is the diversity of their economy. That means that we have more opportunities in a, a broader fields of, of, uh, of excellence than most states have today. It's one of the reasons why recently, within the last year, we have adopted across the board within the state the fact that a study was done that, that indicated that in Utah, by the year 2020, we needed to have 66% of the working population of the state either having a degree or a certificate uh, in a trade uh, I I within the state of Utah. That's just for the jobs that are anticipated that we will have by the year 2020. That means that we have to change substantially because right now we're at about 38% and the statistics are showing that we were going down. Why is the business community so concerned about that? It's because we want to continue to be successful at what we do. So your role, your learning, uh, your capacities are all going to be affected by literally what you're learning today and your application of that. I want to simply make several suggestions to you that I hope will benefit you in the future as you continue to to uh, chart your course in life. Dr. Dupree Jordan said this, success or failure depends more upon attitude than upon capacity. Successful men act as though they have accomplished or are enjoying something. Soon it becomes a reality. Act, look, feel successful. Conduct yourself accordingly and you will be amazed at the positive results. I want to stop there just for a minute to tell you another phenomenon in the state of Utah. I have never been in a place or talked to a group of people that have honed the skill better than people in Utah about being able to find something negative in anything. I don't know what it is. It, it, there is something unique about Utah. 
I call it the kitchen table syndrome. Around the kitchen table, somebody will say something positive, and immediately four or five other people can immediately contradict that or say, yeah, but, yeah, but. Our statistics in Utah are constantly filled with the yeah, buts. People who tell me, we have, we have some of the worst roads in the country, and I want you to know, I look at them and think, oh, you poor soul, you don't travel very much, do you? Because I want you to know, we don't have the worst roads in the nation. In fact, we have some of the best roads. This last year, we had 225 transportation projects under construction at one time. And I'm sure all of you were as excited about that as I am. Because when I went around and I saw all the orange cones, and oh, all you have to do is drive down I-15 in Utah County, and boy, you end up just having a, a, a high because you know things are changing here. How exciting is that? But you know there are people that go home and complain about that every day. You know how long it took me to get to work? You know, can you believe they'd say things like that? Why did we have 225 transportation projects in just UDOT alone this last year, more than any state in the nation? Because business leaders five years ago decided that we'd run our own tax initiatives and ask the citizens of the state of Utah if they would support a quarter of a cent sales tax increase to be able to cover growth in infrastructure in this state. And out of that, we're building I-15 in Utah County, four new light rail lines, a new commuter rail line that will connect Provo with the rest of the Wasatch Front, all for the benefit of businesses and their citizens. The reality is, is that those changes don't come. Why do I then talk about negativity? Because I want you to realize that if you are one of those people that are the yeah buts in life, you ought to change. Because that's not one of the goals of leadership. Anybody can pick out something negative. But leadership are always those people who find the bright spots and look towards that mark and start to grow. Dwight Eisenhower said, you do not lead by hitting people over the head. That's called assault, not leadership. You know, I had the opportunity to be elected to the Utah Senate. And in all honesty, I was such a novice. I had no, that, that was not one of my goals in life. Uh, one day I had, I had some positions that were going to change uh, in my life. Uh, I, I was relatively young at the time, and some people came and said, you ought to run for the Utah legislature. And I thought, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Absolutely not. And another group came, and finally there was just that little bug that I thought, wow, uh, they meet in January and February. I was a real estate broker and developer, and you know that's kind of a slow time. Heck, I can maybe give a few hours of service during that period of time. And I, I, I didn't realize that it actually you had meetings all year long, <laughs> and there were things that you had to do. Uh, it proved to be a phenomenal experience in my life and my family's life personally, but boy, talk about an eye-opening experience uh, to get involved in that. The unique thing for me is when I was elected to the Utah State Senate, I was the youngest member of the Senate. Uh, the average age was uh, 64 years old. Uh, I, at the time, was 34 years old. And, and, you know, that looked a little older than the 60s looked to me today. Uh, since I just turned 60, <laughs> it's much younger than I thought it was the, then. But I'll tell you, I had the advantage that I'm not sure we have today. The men and women who served there were seasoned, professional business people overall. And what I learned from them was, was amazing. Uh, people who put their arms around you and were excited you were involved in that. And they had the ability to, to weigh things much more differently than you seem to hear today uh, out in the press. And things, we, we had an opportunity to, to make some significant differences. And it was a wonderful time. For me, it was 12 years, and it was, and that was a, a in, in my personal decision, was a plenty of time for me, and I decided to, to do some other things in life, and uh, which, which I also don't regret, but absolutely critical in who I am today. They talked about a little bit about leadership and what took place even in the, in the Olympics. Um, Mitt Romney, uh, I, I will tell you, uh, he started about three weeks before I did. Uh, my job was uh, created by 
the Utah legislature uh, be before I was ever asked to be involved in it. And it was an oversight because of, of the embarrassing situations that occurred with our bid process. And it was an oversight where the state Olympic officer had to approve all of the budgets of the Salt Lake Olympic Committee. And I want you to know that Mitt Romney was not used to having anyone approve his budgets. And, uh, and I will also tell you, nor did he need anybody. Uh, Mitt Romney is one of the brightest. This isn't a political speech, but he is one of the brightest human beings I have ever dealt with and probably one of the greatest leaders because he was so forthright. Uh, it, 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 he was very different, irrespective of where you stand politically. Uh, he, he, he was a rare example of a business person who applied the principles in everything that he did uh, in, in life and, and one of the great successes that we had. Our Olympics, uh, most of you were a little younger then, and I don't know how many of you had personal involvement in it, but, but our Olympics had the largest surplus of any Olympics in history. They reported to the IOC, International Olympic Committee, in their final documents that we had a $100 million surplus. That $100 million was divided with $76 million going to the Utah Athletic Foundation to take care of the Olympic facilities and the other portion divided between the IOC and the USOC, which is the customary division that they have of any monies that are left over after any games, which is very rare. But in Utah, we had that. But what they didn't tell you is that in addition to that $100 million, we also paid back to the state of Utah $59 million that was given as upfront money to build the facilities in the first place that came from a vote of the citizens for a quarter of a cent, an eighth of a cent of, of, of income tax that was set aside for just that purpose. They, they, to the University of Utah, built a new stadium with a new capacity that they have there of about 45,000. They built new student housing at the University of Utah, and all of that was just free gratis afterwards. In addition, uh, you add those, all those things together, and it, it well exceeded $200 million. Why? Because of some unique things that took place, and a lot of that was the involvement of people here in the state of Utah and the leadership that was shown there. One of the other opportunities that you need to look at when you talk about leadership is who you are. The uniqueness of today, and, and you in particular, and your generation, is the fact that that uh, you're very proud uh, with the latitude that you have in life. You look back on previous college classes and there are times that if you took a photo of a class 40 years ago, you'd, look, you'd actually see people in ties sitting in the audience. Uh, it's a little bit different. You're a little more casual about who you are today. Uh, the ability to be, so, to, to be individualistic in everything you do is not only a right, but many people think that that is a uniqueness of, of, the, uh, of the growth that society has had. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's a great attribute to have. But if you're really interested in being successful, you ought to learn a few other things also. A book that all of you ought to read, and it ought to be mandatory in my belief, is is a book that's called Dress for Success. It was written by John T. Malloy. It's not even in print anymore, but you can find it almost in any bookstore. It's called Dress for Success. And, uh, and, and even though dress standards have changed, there's some principles in that that are very critical. And basically what it says is, is that you are judged by how you look. And I want you to know that's really true. Uh, I hire people all the time. And I want you to know when they walk in my door, I make a decision about who they are. And that doesn't mean they all have to walk in in the same uniform and act the same way. But I will tell you that it affects the decisions I make almost on a daily basis about who we hire, the businesses we deal with, and what's going to happen. I want you to know that's very true for the people who are going to come and interview many of you for the different, different businesses that come to this campus and talk about opportunities that they have. It is true for Fidelity. It is true for Goldman Sachs. It is true for virtually every other professional organization. That doesn't mean when you go into their offices today, they're all sitting there in three-piece suits. But what it does mean is that you ought to learn the keys of how to look professional for the setting and the opportunities that you're looking for. That also means it's also very true that it's clean and that you're well kept. Well kept means more than just the clothes that you have on your back. 
and you're bright enough to understand what those things mean. You ought to make sure that you understand what shoe polish is. Uh, because in truth, I want you to know there are some people that really believe that's very significant. Uh, and, and how you, the color of the tie that you wear uh, is also significant. Uh, how, you, how your hair is, how your, your clothes fit, uh, you know, what is it you're trying to portray. All of those things are very critical. Well, you ought to learn that they are critical and that they make a difference in your success. The other thing I want to talk about is, is what kind of a personality you have. I'm not here, and I want you to know that no one's going to stand up and change your personality overall. But I do want you to know that there are leadership traits that people look for in personalities in everything that they do. Well, you ought to learn what those are, and you ought to learn what they're not. Because there are some of you in this room who have lousy personalities. <laughs> you ought to find out what those keys are that makes those personalities lousy. Do you talk too much? Do you not talk enough? Are you too loud? Are you too boisterous? Are you one of those people who sit around the kitchen table and find something negative in everything? Are you a complainer? Are you a builder? When I started, I was going to the University of Utah, and I went to work for a company called um, Promark. Promark had a young man that was about, he was literally, I, I think, two years older than I was. He was uh, the family that owned this company. He was one of their sons. And he said something one day that I've never forgotten, and I have used it throughout my life, uh, in professionally as well as in my family. And he said somebody was coming in, and we'd sit down around a table, and we'd talk about the issues, and there were always those that were always complaining about what was going on. We're not doing this right, or you're not doing that, and it was just constantly, constant problems. These are the problems. And he finally said one day something, and, I, and, and I've reminded him of that, because I, I, we still have, have acquaintances on a regular basis. And he finally looked at this person and he said, listen, I know what the problems are. Tell me what the solutions are. And boy, what a difference of outlook that makes in one's life. Anybody can find the problems. But do you have the solutions? Well, I want you to know as a business person, I try every way I can to find out the person that's sitting across my desk from me, if they're the complainer, or if they're the solver, and you tell me which one I'm going to hire. I'm saying not only does it make a difference in what you're hired, but it also makes a difference once you get hired, what kind of a job you do. If I was to give you a quote that you ought to pattern your life over, it would be this. A successful person is a person that's willing to do the things that others are not willing to do. Another way to say the same thing is you should learn to do more than is expected of you. I believe without question that that is the key most, the, 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 the biggest key in the differences of how you're going to be judged between yourself and anybody else in the work field is when somebody has an expectation of what you're supposed to, to deliver, do you do it to what you think they want it delivered or do you over deliver? And I want you to know <laughs> Please over deliver. Always anticipate what it is and do more than is expected of you. And if you will do that, you will have probably the greatest key of success. Oftentimes they talk about the attitudes that are there in the environments that we have today. Your attitudes are very, very critical to your production level, to who you work with, and the responsibilities that you will be given. There are many young people today whose leadership is absolutely astounding. It is amazing to me. I have a young attorney that's working for us right now that, that I, I am constantly amazed with the clarity of his decisions, the power of his influence, and his ability to work through anything. And, and where he got all of these traits, obviously he learned a lot in law school, uh, but he obviously grew up with some traits that have made him quite unique you know, and extremely valuable to us to a, po to a point that, that he's had many opportunities well beyond his age because of that. Those kind of opportunities avail themselves constantly. And again, there's no big surprises. He constantly delivers more than I expect. And, and, and it, it's one of those things I always are coming back, wow, wow. I'll ask for some statistics. I'll ask for something that's going on. And he'll come back with information that, that is just absolutely astounding and, and, and obviously well thought through, but also very well prepared. 
Walter said, the right of commanding is no longer an advantage transmitted by nature. Like an inheritance, it is the fruits of labors and the price of courage. Many of you are going to have an opportunity to reach out on your own. One of the advantages I had early in life was that when I decided I was going to sell real estate, that I had a wife who supported me. Let me tell you why that was so hard. I didn't work eight hours a day. <laughs> if that's one of your goals in life, congratulations. You have just become mediocre. <laughs> if that's the goal of your life, and because that's all you're going to ever have, is you're going to be mediocre your whole life. You're going to have mediocre income. You're going to end up at the age of 60, 65 years old. You're going to have literally, according to national statistics, less than $10,000 in the bank. You're going to have to live off government support or some retirement from some other company if you're lucky enough to have it because you're just mediocre. If you want to live life and experience life, you've got to do something very, very different. That means that you've got to do more than is expected. That means that in an eight-hour day, you have to have some way to deliver more than that. I am an early riser, and I always have been, not because of some natural ability that I just popped out of bed bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but I decided that I wasn't bright as bright as many of the people I dealt with, and that, you know what, I had to outwork them if I wanted to have the same success that some of them maybe very naturally would have. And so I literally forced myself at times that were very difficult out of bed earlier than most other people. Now, I want you to know that's not the greatest uh, um, uh, attribute to my wife that, that I have because when I get out of bed, it, uh, obviously I rustle things up, and, but she's used to it, thanks, thank goodness. But I also had a wife that, that, that understood what I was trying to accomplish. There are many wives that don't understand that, and there's many husbands that don't understand that. Hopefully, you will have the ability to talk through those things. If you're, as my wife had, a, a father who, who worked a job from 8 till 5 every day, that was his job. And he, was, he, he left on the same day. He got home at the same time. For somebody in my life, that was a, uh, my wife, it was very difficult. Well, that didn't become difficult in our, our marriage because she had the leadership and the foresight to understand that what we were investing in was something that was very important. Now, I tell you that because the offside of this story is, is where I worked a lot more than eight hours a day, I want you to know, in my entire life, I've never missed a baseball game. I've never missed a dance recital. I've never missed a graduation, including kindergarten. <laughs> I was there. Why? Because I controlled my own destiny. Some of you will choose to do that. But that also takes a lot of courage from that standpoint. I want to talk to you today about 10 points. And before I do so, all of these notes and all of these quotes that I've left just for your information are available today on our website at slchamber.com. If you'll just get on that, you'll see that I was speaking here. And if you'll just tap on that, you'll be able to download all these remarks. I want to give you uh, uh, some axioms that I believe are very critical for you, and I hope that you'll download this and use it in whatever capacity you have. The ten points are these. Number one, you cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot help small men by tearing down big men. You cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. You cannot lift the wage earner by pulling down the wage payer. With today's interesting discussions going on, that becomes quite relevant. You cannot keep out of trouble by spending more than your income. You cannot further the brotherhood of man by inciting class hatred. You cannot establish sound security on borrowed money. You cannot build character and courage by taking away a man's initiative and independence. You cannot help men permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. In every society we have had, you have, had, you have seen 
a change or a growth in society that, again, is really simple to understand. It's repeated throughout the ages. It goes over and over. I just got home Monday morning very, very early from, from Europe. You go through Europe, some of you have had an opportunity to see that, but boy, if you want to see some real problems, just go over there and start seeing what's happening with their economies. And the number one problem that they have in all of their economies is the fact that they've decided that government had some roles to take care of all of their masses, and then their masses have shrunk. And there's nobody, their populations are shrinking almost in every continent, continent, and they're having a real struggle right now with being able to socially take care of the demands that they have. All you have to do is open up and read what's going on in Greece right now uh, to realize how true that is and how frustrated those people are because of, of the inability to, to build themselves out of that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see over the next uh, few years, and you'll watch that uh, take place, what the final resolve of that is going to be. I want to give you a list of books, not to take away from the dean and all the books that you're required to have here, but if I can, I'm going to give you uh, 10 books that I think that you ought to read and a little bit about why. These books aren't new. There's one that's relatively new. These books were old when I read them, and I haven't just read them once. I, I must tell you, one of, one of my challenges is, is if you walk out to my car today uh, and you stop me anywhere, you will find that I'm listening to something. Now, I'm not one of these hyper people that have to listen to rah-rah speeches every moment of my life. But I constantly am, am, am motivated by positive things that are said by others. And, um, and I, I just, I love it. I, I teach, I speak a lot uh, around, and I get so much out of it. And, um, and I hope that some of you will do the same. There is so much in the today, uh, technically, that it's just a, a keystroke away uh, for your enjoyment. The Game of Work. The Game of Work is written by a Utahan by the name of Charles Coonrad. He lives in Park City, Utah. He wrote it many years ago. It's a simple little book. You can probably pick it up and read it in an evening. Uh, it, to me, it's, it's just one of the classic principles that, that everyone should understand. And the, cra the, the, uh, the, the principle is this. If you keep score, you do better. <laughs> That's how simple it is. If you keep score, you do better. And there's a reason why more, more people like to sit around watching basketball than sitting around watching ice skating. Because in ice skating, very few of us know what a chow chow is or a whatever they're doing jumping around on the ice. We have no way to rate if they did a good job or not. But every time that ball goes through the hole, <laughs> let's see, two, four, six, I can keep up to that. It's exciting. You know what? In business, it's the same principle. One of the most important lessons I ever learned was when, when I was in debt, young man, had a lot of things going on, and finally one day I thought, I ought to add up and find out how, how much I'm in debt, because it started to worry me. And so I sat down with a piece of paper and wrote out every bill that I had, every single bill. Man, the list kept growing. Credit cards kept adding on to, and I just kept going down this list. And I had no idea, no idea how far in debt I was. Once I got that list, it wasn't enough to have the list. But what I then wanted to do was start keeping track on how fast I could pay them off. So unwisely, unwisely, because I didn't pay off the most expensive interest rates first. <laughs> do you know what I paid off? The lowest balances first, because I am driven by checks. <laughs> if I can check something off to this day, I don't operate in my life ever without a daily action list. I, I just don't. I, I fill them out. I constantly have them, and my Blackberry's filled with them. <laughs> and, and you can call it what you want, an obsession, but I am telling you, I have to do that. I, I'm just not bright enough to, to keep track of it all in my mind without, without knowing what it is I'm doing. You know how exciting that was for me to start checking off my debt? Man, that was neat. That was neat. And my wife said, Lane, you've become obsessed and I was. I wanted to get out of debt. It was so exciting for me to get out of debt. And, uh, and believe me, it was a fair amount because I owned a lot of real estate and, and, and the key of that. 
That game of work is something you all ought to read. The Richest Man in Babylon, uh, George Klassen. And, and again, <laughs> again, it was, it, it's just one of those old books. You ought to grab it and read it constantly. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey. You ever heard the statement that a prophet's never accepted in his own country? Only in Utah is Stephen Covey, Covey not as honored as he ought to be. You read that book and, and the fact, forget that he's from Utah. <laughs> for, some, for some reason, forget that he's from Utah. But understand that, that is, that's one of the great books, and you ought to read that because it affects your life. Man's Search for Meaning by F Viktor Frankl. If you want to really be your guts just torn out, uh, this guy was in a Nazi concentration camp and was, was experimented on. And how he developed uh, modern psychology and uh, in, in several factors that, that he was the father of by going through a process that, that you read and it's absolutely disgusting. But what he did is realize that even all of the torment and the pressure and the abuse that was put upon him mentally and physically, that he could control himself. He was truly the only one that controlled his mind and his thought of who he was. Dress for Success, I've mentioned earlier. Uh, good to Great, that's the one that's more commonly, uh, probably college classes on Good to Great. Uh, I had somebody just recently tell, write me a note, uh, emailed me actually, and said, I just got through reading your Good to Great. And he says, you know, two of those companies are out of business. <laughs> I said, oh, he's been sitting around the kitchen table. <clears throat> Swim with the Sharks by Harvey McKay. Great concept. Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino and The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. All of those are available on that same website. Why do I hand these things out to you and tell you about them? We could talk about you know, great leadership and great success in many avenues, in athletics, in the Olympics. Uh, one of the things you find out about as I bring this to a conclusion and, and open up for some questions is how many times I have been shocked about people and who they are. And the story I want to share with you is during the Olympics, the, one of the first meetings I went to was, uh, was the U.S. Olympic team. Not all of them were chosen, but they held a meeting at, uh, at Snow Basin. And I was invited to come up to this big dinner one evening, and all the athletes were represented there from several different, uh, many different venues. And, and this was almost two years prior to our Olympics. So these are the people that were doing everything they can to qualify to be in the Olympics. And my wife and I were standing there, and we were looking at the different kids, and, and some of them would come in, and you'd see these big, long, lanky guys, and you think, ah, I'll bet those are, those are the people that are, in the, are competing in the cross-country skiing. And, and then you'd see a guy walk in that's nose was about this broad. He'd been broken many, many times. And, and you looked at him and thought, that's got to be a hockey player. <laughs> And then there was a little girl that came in. She's a little blonde, little bubbly, cute thing, and she walked in, and, and I said, oh, <laughs> There's the prima ballerina ice skater, you know, and, <clears throat> and, and, and literally enjoying, yeah, that's got to be. And so we sit down at the table, and, and this little blonde-haired girl came over and sat at the table we were at. And so as we got started, I said, I'd like each one of you, if you would, to go around, introduce yourselves. This, I'm, this is who I am, but I'd love to, to meet you. Tell me who you are and, and what sport you compete in. So it went around, and, and we were pretty close on most of them, and it gets to this little girl, and she introduces herself. And she was on the women's hockey team. I, 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 honestly, I was absolutely shocked. And then I saw her play. Holy smokes. She was like a little dynamite package on, on skates. And, but boy, beautiful little girl. I just, again, I made a judgment that was so inaccurate based on looks totally and not on results and, and knowing anything about what they do. We do that all of the time. We need to learn to, to be better at that. Let me, if I can, just take any questions that you might have for just a few minutes uh, before we conclude today. Are there any questions any of you would have about leadership or Utah? Please. I have no idea. <laughs> I just, when I left, gave it to our people, and they said it'll be on the website, and it should say... Uh, uh, something about speak for me speaking down here, and it was on that website. If it's not there, it'll be up very shortly. Thank you. Please. What is it about Utah that's succeeding over so many other states? Number one is our people. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, the, the question was, is what's different about Utah and so many other places, and what's, why are we getting this credit? And the truth is, is you. Our, we have a population of employable people who know how to work. Our, our population produces more than any place else in the country, and in all honesty, with generally a smile in the face. That's before they've had their kitchen dining table meeting. But, uh, but that's the number one reason is the, is the people. Uh, we have a lot of businesses that are started here. You see a lot of people criticize the fact that we have a lot of businesses that, that, uh, uh, that go bankrupt. We also have more businesses started in Utah than any place per capita, and that's another one of those major reasons why. People who think outside the box, and it's very, very typical. And so, in truth, it's, it's because of the education and the quality of the people that are here. Anything else? Yes. To my personal success, you know, number one, my parents. Um, I was one of eight children. Uh, I grew up with responsibilities every day. Uh, my mother was a true disciplinarian. Uh, she taught humanities at Davis High School for many years, and and uh, she played games around our kitchen table that that ended up being huge advantages to me, like like who painted this painting, <laughs> what's a verb, what's a noun. She, those were games we played as little children. Uh, but the biggest is my work ethic. Uh, I promise you, most people don't outwork me, and uh, and that and and that was just something I grew up. With. I didn't know that most people didn't do that, and so uh, we had responsibilities. If I didn't make my bed in the morning, I didn't play in the afternoon. And and let me just tell you, that wasn't a threat; it was reality. <laughs> and uh, and and that made me responsible for some of my own actions. And uh, I so I'm very grateful for my mother, who who literally. Uh, Help me become who I am. Please. How do you lead and inspire uh, organizations for the Native Roots Perkaskis? I didn't hear the end of the question. Uh, how do you lead an organization that is full of Native Roots Perkaskis? You know, by, by being positive. I think, I think the bottom line is, is you get a little sensitive about sarcasm and, and, and being around negative people, and it really does draw people down. There have been studies that, that, uh, that they... they in, in Russia, they've had some studies that measure the aura around people, and they, they, they then affect what the aura, the light, the, the energy field that comes around a human being, and what affects that energy. Some people literally ra uh, radiate with it. You can walk into a room, and, what, and, 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 and you literally will notice certain individuals. It, 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 what is that? Is that leadership? You know, what is it that makes a difference? Well, there are people that they tried to measure some of that. And at the same time, negativity just shrinks that, shrinks it, shrinks it, to a point where some pe people literally don't have an aura. And, it, and, and they find that people who are, who are positive, whether it's the endorphins in the brain that have, have released certain chemicals, whatever it's going to be, it does make a difference. And so I think the, at, at times you just have to work your way through that. Find the positive, not the negative. That doesn't mean you, you – I am truly an optimist. But I want you to know, in my role of the Olympics, my job was to make sure we didn't have any problems. I had to look at every problem there was and make sure that it was, it was solved beforehand. My conversations with Mitt Romney were, were Mitt, Mitt was interested in making sure that the Olympics inside the fence were very successful, which was amazing. My job was to make sure the entire state was successful. And, and so we had a different outlook. And at times, uh, we had some interesting conversations. But they were never negative. They, they were deliberate, and, and, and at times we disagreed with each other, but we came to a, a reasonable solution because of, of, of the well-being. And that, what a pleasure it is to work with somebody like that versus somebody who's negative and just finds something negative in everything. Yes? What does your morning schedule <laughs> Just coming home from uh, normally, I usually get up at about 4.35 o'clock. And, uh, and I, I usually get up uh, and, uh, and go into an office in my home and get on my computer and I, I look at my tasks for the day to make sure I know what my schedule is. And then I just I do a variety of different things. I do do some exercises. Uh, you wouldn't know that. Uh, and if I took my suit coat off, you'd know I don't do that as often as I should. But, but I do uh, uh, have to do that uh, occasionally. So I'll go out and usually do that and then come back. I get to my office usually a little earlier than most others. Um, and there are oftentimes I'll get up and be at my office at 4 o'clock in the morning. If I get behind at my office, st stacks of information because it, it's pretty uh, 
constant there. I find that I can get a lot more done when I'm there all by myself. You know, I love to play. I, I just love life. I, I, I have to tell you, I don't know anything that is more motivational to me than just enjoying life. And I really do enjoy life. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I love being with my family, uh, my brothers and sisters, my grandchildren. Uh, uh, I have 12 acres where I live, and the whole reason I have 12 acres is, is because my grandkids can come and play in their own park. And we have horses and we have those things that, that are just really fun for me. So my motivation is, is them. My number one priority, and, and this isn't just a cliche, it truly is my family. I just love being with my family. And so I, that, that's a high, high priority for me. So getting up early when I have an opportunity to spend some time with them, there's no sacrifice there at all. And it's just something that you get used to over, over, uh, over life. The other thing is, is, is uh, seeing other people's success. I, I just have to tell you, I, I have the neatest job in the world at the Chamber. We, we're a statewide organization. We have businesses in every county in the state. And I get involved in those. There's, there's probably not a major corporation that's come to Utah in the last eight years that I haven't been involved in. And, and that is really unique because they, these companies come from all over the country and the world and decide where they're going to move. And at times, we don't know who they are. They give us fake names as they're looking at, at, at when, when um, Procter & Gamble came to Box Elder County. When they first came in, they, were, they had a totally different name. <laughs> they didn't tell us it was Procter & Gamble. We knew that it was somebody else than the name because they were just very close-mouthed about it. But when they decided, number one reason was the way they were treated by the citizens up there, and that's why they were there. So, Anything else? Let me just say this. Is, is, it's time to let you go, but thank you again. What an incredible honor it is to be in an institution that prides themselves on, on productivity. And that productivity comes from business schools. And I wish you the very best in making sure that this life is much better for you and your children than it was for me. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>